Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come come back, back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back? The Room in the Tower It is probable that everybody who is at all a constant dreamer has had at least one experience of an event or a sequence of circumstances which have come to his mind in sleep, being subsequently realised in the material world. But, in my opinion, so far from this being a strange thing, it would be far odder if this fulfilment did not occasionally happen, since our dreams are, as a rule, concerned with people whom we know and places with which we are familiar, such as might very naturally occur in the awake and daylit world. True, these dreams are often broken into by some absurd and fantastic incident which puts them out of court in regard to their subsequent fulfilment. But on the mere calculation of chances, it does not appear in the least unlikely that a dream imagined by anyone who dreams constantly should occasionally come true. Not long ago, for instance, I experienced such a fulfilment of a dream, which seems to me in no way remarkable and to have no kind of psychical significance. The manner of it was as follows. A certain friend of mine, living abroad, is amiable enough to write to me about once a fortnight. Thus, when fourteen days or thereabouts have elapsed since I last heard from him, my mind, probably, either consciously or subconsciously, is expectant of a letter from him. One night last week I dreamed that as I was going upstairs to dress for dinner I heard, as I often heard, the sound of the postman's knock on my front door, and diverted my direction downstairs instead. There, among other correspondence, was a letter from him. Thereafter the fantastic entered, for on opening it I found inside the ace of diamonds, and scribbled across it in his well-known handwriting, I am sending you this for safe custody, as you know it is running an unreasonable risk to keep aces in Italy. The next evening I was just preparing to go upstairs to dress when I heard the postman's knock, and did precisely as I had done in my dream. There, among the other letters, was one from my friend only it did not contain the Ace of Diamonds. Had it done so, I should have attached more weight to the matter, which, as it stands, seems to me a perfectly ordinary coincidence. No doubt I consciously or subconsciously expected a letter from him, and this suggested to me my dream. Similarly, the fact that my friend had not written to me for a fortnight suggested to him that he should do so. But occasionally, it is not so easy to find such an explanation. And for the following story, I can find no explanation at all. It came out of the dark, and into the dark it has gone again. All my life I have been a habitual dreamer. The nights are few, that is to say, when I do not find on awaking in the morning that some mental experience has been mine and sometimes, all night long, apparently, a series of the most dazzling adventures before me. Almost without exception, these adventures are pleasant, though often merely trivial. It is of an exception that I am going to speak. It was when I was about sixteen that a certain dream first came to me, and this is how it befell. It opened with my being set down at the door of a big red brick house, where I understood I was going to stay. The servant who opened the door told me that tea was being served in the garden, and led me through a low, dark panelled hall with a large open fireplace onto a cheerful green lawn set round with flower beds. There were grouped about the tea table a small party of people, but they were all strangers to me except one, who was a schoolfellow called Jack Stone, clearly the son of the house, and he introduced me to his mother and father and a couple of sisters. I was, I remember, somewhat astonished to find myself here, for the boy in question was scarcely known to me, and I rather disliked what I knew of him. Moreover, he had left school nearly a year before. The afternoon was very hot, and an intolerable oppression reigned. On the far side of the lawn ran a red brick wall, with an iron gate in its centre, outside which stood a walnut tree. We sat in the shadow of the house opposite a row of long windows, inside which I could see a table with cloth laid, glimmering with glass and silver. This garden front of the house was very long, 
and at one end of it stood a tower of three stories which looked to me much older than the rest of the building. Before long, Mrs. Stone, who, like the rest of the party, had sat in absolute silence, said to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. Quite inexplicably, my heart sank at her words. I felt as if I had known that I should have the room in the tower, and that it contained something dreadful and significant. Jack instantly got up, and I understood that I had to follow him. In silence we passed through the hall, and mounted a great oak staircase with many corners, and arrived at a small landing with two doors set in it. He pushed one of these open for me to enter, and without coming in himself, closed it after me. Then I knew that my conjecture had been right. There was something awful in the room. And with the terror of nightmare growing swiftly and enveloping me, I awoke in a spasm of terror. Now that dream, or variations on it, occurred to me intermittently for fifteen years. Most often it came in exactly this form, the arrival, the tea laid out on the lawn, the deadly silence succeeded by that one deadly sentence the mounting with Jack Stone up to the room in the tower where horror dwelt, and it always came to a close in the nightmare of terror at that which was in the room, though I never saw what it was. At other times I experienced variations on this same theme. Occasionally, for instance, we would be sitting at dinner in the dining room, into the windows of which I had looked on the first night when the dream of this house visited me. But wherever we were, there was always the same silence, the same sense of dreadful oppression and foreboding, and the silence I knew would always be broken by Mrs. Stone saying to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. Upon which this was invariable, I had to follow him up the oak staircase with many corners, and enter the place that I dreaded more and more each time that I visited it in sleep. Or again, I would find myself playing cards still in silence in a drawing-room lit with immense chandeliers that gave a blinding illumination. But what the game was, I have no idea. What I remember, with a sense of miserable anticipation, was that soon Mrs. Stone would get up and say to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. This drawing-room, where we played cards, was next to the dining-room, and, as I have said, was always brilliantly illuminated, whereas the rest of the house was full of dusk and shadows. And yet, how often, in spite of those bouquet of lights, have I not pored over the cards that were dealt to me, scarcely able for some reason to see them. Their designs, too, were strange. There were no red suits, but all were black, and among them there were certain cards which were black all over. I hated and dreaded those. As this dream continued to recur, I got to know the greater part of the house. There was a smoking room beyond the drawing room, at the end of the passage with a green baize door. It was always very dark there, and as often as I went there, I passed somebody whom I could not see in the doorway, coming out. Curious developments, too, took place in the characters that peopled the dream as might happen to living persons. Mrs. Stone, for instance, who when I first saw her had been black-haired, became grey, and instead of rising briskly as she had done at first when she said, Jack will show you your room, I have given you the room in the tower, got up very feebly, as if the strength was leaving her limbs. Jack also grew up and became a rather ill-looking young man, with a brown moustache, while one of the sisters ceased to appear, and I understood she was married. Then it so happened that I was not visited by this dream for six months or more, and I began to hope, in such inexplicable dread did I hold it, that it had passed away for good. But one night after this interval, I again found myself being shown out onto the lawn for tea, and Mrs. Stone was not there, while the others were all dressed in black. At once I guessed the reason, and my heart leaped at the thought that perhaps this time I should not have to sleep in the room with the tower. 
and though we usually all sat in silence, on this occasion the sense of relief made me talk and laugh as I had never yet done. But even then matters were not altogether comfortable, for no one else spoke, but they all looked secretly at each other. And soon the foolish stream of my talk ran dry, and gradually an apprehension worse than anything I had previously known gained on me as the light slowly faded. Suddenly a voice which I knew well broke the stillness, the voice of Mrs. Stone, saying, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. It seemed to come from near the gate in the red brick wall that bounded the lawn, and looking up I saw that the grass outside was sown thick with gravestones. A curious greyish light shone from them, and I could read the lettering on the grave nearest to me and it was in evil memory of Julia Stone. And as usual, Jack got up, and again I followed him through the hall and up the staircase with many corners. On this occasion it was darker than usual, and when I passed into the room in the tower I could only just see the furniture, the position of which was already familiar to me. Also, there was a dreadful odour of decay in the room, and I woke screaming. This dream, with such variations and developments as I have mentioned, went on at intervals for fifteen years. Sometimes I would dream it two or three nights in succession. Once, as I have said, there was an intermission of six months, but taking a reasonable average, I should say that I dreamed it quite as often as once in a month. It had, as is plain, something of nightmare about it, since it always ended in the same appalling terror, which, so far from getting less, seemed to me to gather fresh fear every time that I experienced it. There was, too, a strange and dreadful consistency about it. The characters in it, as I have mentioned, got regularly older. Death and marriage visited this silent family and I never in the dream, after Mrs. Stone had died, set eyes on her again. But it was always her voice that told me that the room in the tower was prepared for me, and whether we had tea out on the lawn or the scene was laid in one of the rooms overlooking it, I could always see her gravestone standing just outside the iron gate. It was the same, too, with the married daughter. Usually she wasn't present, but once or twice she returned again in company with a man whom I took to be her husband. He too, like the rest of them, was always silent, but owing to the constant repetition of the dream I had ceased to attach in my waking hours any significance to it. I never met Jack Stone again during all those years, nor did I ever see a house that resembled this dark house of my dream. And then something happened. I had been in London in this year up till the end of July, and during the first week in August went down to stay with a friend in a house he had taken for the summer months in the Ashdown Forest district of Sussex. I left London early, for John Clinton was to meet me at Forest Row Station, and we were going to spend the day golfing and go to his house in the evening. He had his motor with him, and we set off about five of the afternoon after a thoroughly delightful day for the drive the distance being some ten miles. As it was still so early, we did not have tea at the clubhouse, but waited till we should get home. As we drove, the weather, which up till then had been, though hot, deliciously fresh, seemed to me to alter in quality and become very stagnant and oppressive, and I felt that undefinable sense of ominous apprehension that I am accustomed to before thunder. John, however, did not share my views, attributing my loss of lightness to the fact that I had lost both my matches. Events proved, however, that I was right, though I do not think that the thunderstorm that broke that night was the sole cause of my depression. Our way lay through deep, high-banked lanes, and before we had gone very far I fell asleep and was only awakened by the stopping of the motor, and with a sudden thrill, partly of fear but chiefly of curiosity, I found myself standing in the doorway of my house of dream. We went, I half wondering whether or not I was dreaming still, 
through a low oak-panelled hall and out onto the lawn, where tea was laid in the shadow of the house. It was set in flower beds, a red brick wall with a gate in it bound at one side, and out beyond that was a space of rough grass with a walnut tree. The facade of the house was very long, and at one end stood a three-storied tower, markedly older than the rest. Here, for the moment, all resemblance to the repeated dreams ceased. There was no silent and somehow terrible family, but a large assembly of exceedingly cheerful persons, all of whom were known to me. And in spite of the horror with which the dream itself had always filled me, I felt nothing of it now that the scene of it was thus reproduced before me, but I felt the intensest curiosity as to what was going to happen. T pursued its cheerful course, and before long Mrs. Clinton got up, and at that moment I think I knew what she was going to say. She spoke to me, and what she said was, Jack will show you to your room. I have given you the room in the tower. And that, for half a second, the horror of the dream took hold of me again. But it quickly passed, and again I felt nothing more than the most intense curiosity. It was not very long before it was amply satisfied. John turned to me. Right up at the top of the house, he said. But I think you'll be comfortable. We're absolutely full up. Would you like to go and see it now? By Jove, I believe that you're right and that we're going to have a thunderstorm. How dark it has become. I got up and followed him. We passed through the hall and up the perfectly familiar staircase. Then he opened the door and I went in. And at that moment, sheer, unreasoning terror again possessed me. I did not know what I feared. I simply feared. Then, like a sudden recollection when one remembers a name which has long escaped the memory, I knew what I feared. I feared Mrs. Stone, whose grave with the sinister inscription in evil memory. I had so often seen in my dream, just beyond the lawn, which lay below my window. And then, once more, the fear passed so completely that I wondered what there was to fear, and I found myself sober and quiet and sane in the room in the tower, the name of which I had so often heard in my dream, and the scene of which was so familiar. I looked around it with a certain sense of proprietorship, and found that nothing had been changed from the dreaming nights in which I knew it so well. Just to the left of the door was the bed, lengthways along the wall, with the head of it in the angle. In a line with it was the fireplace and the small bookcase. Opposite the door, the outer wall was pierced by two lattice-paned windows, between which stood the dressing table, while ranged along the fourth wall was the washing stand and the big cupboard. My luggage had already been unpacked, for the furniture of dressing and undressing lay orderly on the washstand and toilet table, while my dinner clothes were spread out on the coverlet of the bed, and then, with a sudden start of unexplained dismay, I saw that there were two rather conspicuous objects which I had not seen before in my dreams. One, a life-sized oil painting of Mrs. Stone. The other, a black and white sketch of Jack Stone, representing him as he had appeared to me only a week before in the last of the series of these repeated dreams. A rather secret and evil-looking man of about thirty. His picture hung between the windows, looking straight across the room to the other portrait, which hung at the side of the bed. At that I looked next, and as I looked I felt once more the horror of nightmare seize me. It represented Mrs. Stone as I had seen her last in my dreams, old and withered and white-haired. But in spite of the evident feebleness of body, a dreadful exuberance and vitality shone through the envelope of flesh, an exuberance wholly malign, a vitality that foamed and frothed with unimaginable evil. Evil beamed from the narrow leering eyes, it laughed in the demon-like mouth. The whole face was instinct with some secret and appalling mirth. The hands clasped together on the knee, 
seemed shaking with suppressed and nameless glee. Then I saw also that it was signed in the left-hand bottom corner, and wondering who the artist could be, I looked more closely and read the inscription. Julia Stone. By Julia Stone. The chemist tap at the door and John Clinton entered. Got everything you want? he asked. Rather more than I want, I said, pointing to the picture. He laughed. Hard-featured old lady, he said. By herself, too, I remember. Anyway, she can't have flattered herself much. But don't you see, I said, it's scarcely a human face at all. It's a face of some witch, of some devil. He looked at it more closely. Yes, it isn't very pleasant, he said. Scarcely a bedside manner, eh? Yes, I can imagine getting the nightmare if I went to sleep with that close by my bed. I'll have it taken down, if you like. I really wish you would. I said. He rang the bell, and with the help of a servant we detached the picture and carried it out onto the landing, and put it with its face to the wall. "'By Jove, the old lady's a wait, said John, mopping his forehead. "'I wonder if she had something on her mind.' The extraordinary weight of the picture had struck me, too. I was about to reply when I caught sight of my own hand. There was blood on it, in considerable qualities, covering the whole palm. Oh, I've cut myself somehow, said I. John gave a little startled exclamation. Why, I have too, he said. Simultaneously the footman took out his handkerchief and wiped his hand with it. I saw that there was blood also on his handkerchief. John and I went back into the tower room and washed the blood off, but neither on his hand nor on mine was there the slightest trace of a scratch or cut. It seemed to me that having ascertained this, we both, by a sort of tacit consent, did not allude to it again. Something in my case had dimly occurred to me that I did not wish to think about. It was but a conjecture, but I fancied that I knew the same thing had occurred to him. The heat and oppression of the air, for the storm we had expected was still undischarged, increased very much after dinner and for some time most of the party, among whom were John Clinton and myself, sat outside on the path bounding the lawn, where we had had tea. The night was absolutely dark, and no twinkle of star or moon ray could penetrate the pall of cloud that overset the sky. By degrees our assembly thinned, the women went up to bed, men dispersed to the smoking or billiard room, and by eleven o'clock my host and I were the only two left. All the evening I thought that he had something on his mind, and as soon as we were alone, he spoke. The man who helped us with the picture had blood on his hand too. Did you notice? he said. I asked him just now if he had cut himself, and he said he supposed he had, but that he could find no mark of it. Now where did that blood come from? By dint of telling myself that I was not going to think about it, I had succeeded in not doing so and I did not want, especially just at bedtime, to be reminded of it. I don't know, said I, and I don't really care, so long as the picture of Mrs. Stone is not by my bed. He got up. But it's odd, he said. Ah, now you'll see another odd thing. A dog of his, an Irish terrier by breed, had come out of the house as we talked. The door behind us into the hall was open, and a bright oblong of light shone across the lawn to the iron gate which led on to the rough grass outside where the walnut tree stood. I saw that the dog had all his hackles up, bristling with rage and fright. His lips were curled back from his teeth, as if he was ready to spring at something, and he was growling to himself. He took not the slightest notice of his master nor me, but stiffly and tensely walked across the grass to the iron gate. There he stood for a moment, looking through the bars, and still growling. Then, of a sudden, his courage seemed to desert him. He gave one long howl and scuttled back to the house with a curious, crouching sort of movement. He does that half a dozen times a day, said John. He sees something which he both hates and fears. I walked to the gate and looked over it. Something was moving on the grass outside, and soon a sound which I could not instantly identify came to my ears. Then I remembered what it was. It was the purring of a cat. I lit a match and saw the purrer, a big blue Persian, walking round and round in a little circle just outside the gate, stepping high and ecstatically, with tail carried aloft like a banner. 
Its eyes were bright and shining, and every now and then it put its head down and sniffed at the grass. I laughed. The end of that mystery, I'm afraid, he said. Here's a large cat having a Valpurgis night all alone. Yes, that's Darius, said John. He spends half the day and all night there. But that's not the end of the dog mystery, for Toby and he are the best of friends. But the beginning of the cat mystery. What's the cat doing there? And why is Darius pleased while Toby is terror-stricken? At that moment I remembered the rather horrible detail of my dreams when I saw through the gate, just where the cat was now, the white tombstone with the sinister inscription. But before I could answer, the rain began, as suddenly and heavily as if a tap had been turned on, and simultaneously the big cat squeezed through the bars of the gate and came leaping across the lawn to the house for shelter. There it sat in the doorway, looking out eagerly into the dark. It spat and struck at John with its paw as he pushed it in in order to close the door. Somehow, with the portrait of Julia Stone in the passage outside, the room in the tower had absolutely no alarm for me, and as I went to bed feeling very sleepy and heavy, I had nothing more than interest for the curious incident about our bleeding hands and the conduct of the cat and dog. The last thing I looked at before I put out my light was the square empty space by my bed where the portrait had been. Here the paper was of its original full tint of dark red. Over the rest of the walls it had faded. Then I blew out my candle and fell instantly asleep. My awaking was equally instantaneous, and I sat bolt upright in bed under the impression that some bright light had been flashed in my face though it was now absolutely pitch dark. I knew exactly where I was, in the room which I had dreaded in dreams, but no horror that I ever felt when asleep approached the fear that now invaded and froze my brain. Immediately after, a peal of thunder crackled just above the house, but the probability that it was only a flash of lightning which awoke me gave no reassurance to my galloping heart. Something, I knew, was in the room with me. And instinctively I put out my right hand, which was nearest the wall, to keep it away. And my hand touched the edge of a picture frame hanging close to me. I sprang out of the bed, upsetting the small table that stood by it, and I heard my watch, candle and matches clatter onto the floor. But for the moment... There was no need of light, for a blinding flash leaped out of the clouds and showed me that by my bed again hung the picture of Mrs. Stone, and instantly the room went into blackness again. But in that flash I saw another thing also, namely a figure that leaned over the end of my bed, watching me. It was dressed in some close clinging white garment, spotted and stained with mould, and the face was that of the portrait. Overhead the thunder cracked and roared, and when it ceased and the deathly stillness succeeded, I heard the rustle of movement coming nearer me, and, more horrible yet, perceived an odour of corruption and decay. And then... A hand was laid on the side of my neck, and close beside my ear I heard quick-taken, eager breathing. Yet I knew that this thing, though it could be perceived by touch, by smell, by eye and by ear, was still not of this earth, but something that had passed out of the body and had power to make itself manifest. Then a voice already familiar to me, spoke. I knew you would come to the room in the tower, it said. I have been long waiting for you. At last you have come. Tonight I shall feast. Before long we will feast together. And the quick breathing came closer to me. I could feel it on my neck. 
At that, the terror which I think had paralysed me for the moment gave way to the wild instinct of self-preservation. I hit wildly with both arms, kicking out at the same moment, and heard a little animal squeal, and something soft dropped with a thud beside me. I took a couple of steps forward, nearly tripping up over whatever it was that lay there, and by the merest good luck found the handle of the door. In another second I ran out onto the landing and had banged the door behind me. Almost at the same moment I heard a door open somewhere below, and John Clinton, candle in hand, came running upstairs. "'What is it?' he said. I, "'I sleep just below you, and heard a noise as if, good heavens, there's blood on your shoulder.' I stood there, so he told me afterwards, swaying from side to side, white as a sheet, with the mark on my shoulder, as if a hand covered with blood had been laid there. It's in there, I said, pointing. She, you know, the portrait's in there too, hanging up on the place we took it from. At that, he laughed. My dear fellow, this is mere nightmare, he said. He pushed by me and opened the door I, standing there simply inert with terror, unable to stop him, unable to move. Phew, what an awful smell, he said. Then there was silence. He had passed out of my sight behind the open door. Next moment he came out again, as white as myself, and instantly shut it. Yes, the portrait's there, he said. And on the floor is a thing, a thing spotted with earth, like what they bury people in. Come away, yeah, quick, come away. How I got downstairs, I hardly know. An awful shuddering and nausea of the spirit rather than of the flesh had seized me, and more than once he had to place my feet upon the steps, while every now and then he cast glances of terror and apprehension up the stairs. But in time we came to his dressing room on the floor below, and there I told him what I have here described. The sequel can be made short. Indeed, some of my readers have perhaps already guessed what it was, if they remember that inexplicable affair of the churchyard at West Forley some eight years ago, where an attempt was made three times to bury the body of a certain woman who had committed suicide. On each occasion the coffin was found in the course of a few days again protruding from the ground. After the third attempt, in order that the thing should not be talked about, the body was buried elsewhere, in unconsecrated ground. Where it was buried was just outside the iron gate of the garden belonging to the house where this woman had lived. She had committed suicide in a room at the top of the tower in that house. Her name was Julia Stone. Subsequently, the body was again secretly dug up, and the coffin was found to be full of blood. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. Everybody that way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patrons-only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. That was The Room in the Tower by E.F. Benson. Now, the sharp amongst you will remember that I did that in 2009. And it's still available as episode two, I think, of the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. So it's dating back to about September 2019. I said nine. I didn't mean to say nine. So um, the reason I'm doing, I've done it again. This is a 2023 version because I listened back to the 2019 and the sound wasn't great. I think I've improved my. Um, I've learned a lot since then, both in terms of technicalities of how to narrate a story, but also I've got better equipment now, and I'm, I'm possibly better at editing it. Not that there's, well, yeah, hopefully there won't be mis-edits in that one, and uh, if, if there are, let me know. It is useful if you do let me know in the comments. I'm, I don't take it personally. It actually helps me. So um, it's a great story, and I'll tell you the reason why I came to re-record it was I've just done a compilation of E.F. Benson's um, stuff for YouTube. Now, you may know that mostly people use my work, my work, darling, um, my stories, what I read, um, to... Uh, fall asleep to and uh, I, don't, I don't know how they do that because particularly these ones they're, they're quite horrific if I was kind of subliminally listening whilst dozing to some of these stories I would have the most tremendous nightmares but um, apparently it's just the trick for some people so what they like is um, a compilation what people like is a compilation so I put together a long compilation of three plus hours of EF Benson's 
stories I like most. Probably one which is really disturbing, which I haven't done, not for any other reason than I haven't had time to do it, is Caterpillars. Um, that's a great story. There's one about the bus, bus as well. Uh, so they're not on it. There's plenty of time to do more EF Benson stuff. But uh, the reason I've redone The Room in the Tower was when I listened to it, it wasn't good enough to go with the rest of the others. So I redid it and I thought, well, listen, just as a as a little treat, it's going to go out on YouTube because that's I haven't got enough hosting to do it as the podcast. So if you want to listen to the long ones, you need to go to YouTube, really. Uh, not Patreon, not anywhere, because it's just the capacity. YouTube's a huge thing. It can... It can take these long, long, long compilations. So, but I thought I would put this one out as a bonus episode on the podcast. Um, hopefully, people like it. I think it's a great story. I think it's really quite disturbing. And um, elsewhere, when I commented on this, it was it was an inspiration for one of my own stories called "He Waits," which you can find, which is about a recurring dream. And also, by coincidence, I had a person tell me about a recurring dream they had that was very similar. And this was a real person telling me a real story. They didn't know about this, E.F. Benson. This was not the context. We weren't talking about ghost stories, uh, you know, literary ghost stories. So the, and this is years ago anyway. But um, I, I've told the tale elsewhere. But uh, and, and Sheila says that to me. You've told me that before. And I say, well, listen, the telling of a story is a pleasure in itself. It's not the fact. It's not information. It's the storytelling. Funnily enough, you know how I ramble. I was only going to keep this really short, which, which it will be. But... Um, I was reading something about books and it was saying, an article was saying about how books now you, uh, on Instabook and Tick BookTok. So Instagram and, and TikTok, um, you, you have very short opportunities to talk about books. And what they said was, this article pointed out, was that when they talk about books on the, in these um, fora, they are talking about how pretty they are and people are, have their bookshelves and have they arrange their covers, like rainbow covers and uh, and what is my favourite cover? So the point was being that it wasn't about the, what's in the book. And the, the article said, it kind of lamented this a bit and then said, well, you know, when books first came along, we lost something. We forget that. We lost oral storytelling. So we all love our books, don't we? We've all got lots of them, I'm sure. And we love, love, love our books. But what we, what we, and, and we hate AI writing and we hate all this modern world. But what we forget is that books displaced oral storytelling. And what was lost there was the sound of the voice, the intonation, the gestures, the pauses, the, the um, performance of storytelling. So I actually was, um, I'd like to, do, I've done live storytelling before, but I've actually um, read it. I've, do, I've actually narrated some of my own stories from memory uh, on, again, on YouTube. I would like to start a, um, and I'm got, I've just put something up on Facebook. There's a book, a, a local group about of literary people who write stories and things. And I thought, well, I wonder if uh, somebody would be interested. Now, you don't know Steve Wharton. Steve Wharton's gone back to teach in China uh, from Cumbria uh, with his family, which is a great shame, really, in many ways, because uh, he had collected some Cumbrian fo folk songs and uh, put them to music and, and done books on them and was performing and 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 some modern stuff as well based on that tradition and i think it's a great loss that when people like this there isn't the audience for them and, and steve would have been a great guy i remember going to see him at the, the keswick at the theater there when he did a production of he of a, a version of um leloikin Le leloikin was a, a scottish um british scottish celtic guy who ran into trouble uh, it was probably a version of Merlin. Um, he ran into trouble. And funnily enough, my friend Tom Morris from the Privart, Tom Morris, is doing a version of that story in Welsh. I think he's doing it in Welsh. He might be doing it in English. Tlachogen, who, which is the original. So uh, it's a Dark Age story. Anyway, Steve Wharton, I've digressed, did a production of this, which was really good. So, uh, so winding it back into the point, um, things change. Books may be prized by many now only for their covers, but, and we lament that, but the point was when we had books, books came in and we um, read stories silently to ourselves, we lost something of performance. And I'm bringing it back to you. Is that the point? Anyway, okay, I hope you're all well. I, we've got to go out tonight. It's Sheila's birthday soon. We've been having an extended birthday period. We've just been up to see Peter Gabriel in Glasgow yesterday 
Uh, we've just come back from our long, long walk in the south of England through Wiltshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, a bit of Hertfordshire. Um, on the Ridgeway, that was super duper, and I'm sure I'll talk about that elsewhere. So this is just a bonus episode of EF, EF as I call him. I'm not going to give you too much biography about EF because you can find it elsewhere. I've spoken about him elsewhere. Um, I hope you like it. I hope you are terrified like I was. I like the thumbnail as well. Um, again, produced with AI, that thumbnail. It was a mid-journey thumbnail. Uh, the music is not AI. It's Jonathan um, Sharp's The Heartwood Institute. Jonathan's just produced a new album called Mist Over Pendle, about the Pendle Witches. Fantastic stuff. Um, I, love, I love it. I'm looking forward to an opportunity to collaborate with Jonathan again because he's a very, very talented man and he very generously allows me to use this music free of charge. Okay. All right, I hope you're all well. I've said that. Bye. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so dies, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Dies, you tried to get into the Isn't locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the dead come back, Mother? Today, you? What's the secret of the dead come back? Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?